malignant gliomas. This is a video that can be found on the website about cancer.com that explores the role of radiation in the treatment of malignant gliomas, particularly glioblastoma multiforme. A primary brain tumor originates in the brain from a normal brain cell that goes bad because of a genetic mutation. A glial cell that goes bad would form a glioma. Brain metastases or cancers that have started elsewhere in the body, such as lung cancer or breast cancer, and then spread secondarily to the brain. There's a separate video that discusses brain metastases. Malignant gliomas are the most common and most serious primary brain tumor. Glioblastoma is overwhelmingly the most common. This is often called a grade 4 glioma. The grade 3 gliomas, such as an anaplastic astrocytoma or an anaplastic oligodendroglioma, are less common and have a slightly more favorable outlook. Who gets brain cancer? The incidence of these tumors has been increasing over the last two decades. It's more common in men than women. It's more common in whites than black. The median age for a glioblastoma is 64. A malignant glioma occurs at a somewhat younger age, 45. These are uncommon malignancies. The odds of ever being diagnosed with a brain tumor in man is only 0.67%, and the odds of ever dying of this cancer 0.49%. The numbers for women are even smaller, as noted. The symptoms of a brain tumor include headaches, visual changes, change in personality, and other muscle or motor, cha motor changes. About 20% of patients may present with a seizure, and all told 40 or 70% of patients may eventually have a seizure. Brain swelling is common with a brain tumor because the pressure expands inside the cranium or the skull. This can be seen in an MRI as shown here, the brain tumor in white. The edema or swelling is somewhat darker. Patients are often treated with decadron or dexamethasone which is a steroid to decrease brain swelling. Again, the symptoms by grade, headache, seizures, other memory or motor function loss is quite common. The most important thing with the brain tumor is first determining is it benign or malignant. There are common benign tumors, particularly meningioma. If it's a malignant cell, it will be named after that cell if possible and then graded. A low grade or grade 1 or 2 is a slow growing glioma. High grade is much more malignant and much more serious. Again, the most common benign brain tumor would be a meningioma, and the most common malignant brain tumor would be a glioblastoma. These can be classified by the appearance under the microscope, and the WHO has a classification scheme. Normally, the pathologist can separate an anaplastic or grade 3 glioma from a glioblastoma or grade 4. The grade is important because the survival is dramatically different based on grade, as shown in this study from the RTOG. Uh, other survival comparisons with an anaplastic astrocytoma, five-year survival is 27%. If the patient has a certain genetic abnormality at 1P19Q, they respond so much better to chemotherapy, their survival is much better, even 50%. Glioblastoma patients have a survival that is probably less than 5%. The cell of origin is not clear. Any of these stem cells can go bad and turn malignant and turn into a tumor initiating cell. And then further genetic mutations will progress to a brain cancer propagating cell, as noted here. Once these cells continue to mutate, it can form one of several different subtypes of glioblastoma. These have all been shown now to have increasingly complex genetic and metabolic and biochemical abnormalities. The age of these tumors has been discussed. This is a tumor more common as patients get older. And the survival is significantly related to the type of brain tumor. As described, a meningioma has a very good outlook a glioblastoma, unfortunately, is at the bottom of this table. Brain imaging is critical in diagnosing and treating these type of tumors, particularly MRIs. 
A glioblastoma has a characteristic appearance on an MRI with irregular borders and often a necrotic center that looks black or dark on an MRI. Glioblastomas are also well known because they spread diffusely through the brain. In this imaging study, the green shows that the glioblastoma has spread fairly extensively throughout the brain, making this very difficult to either cut out surgically or to target with radio surgery. And this image from a pathology report shows the extent of the glioma irregularly infiltrating into the brain. Gliomas are also considered very rapid growing cancers, glioblastomas particularly. Here's a case where in one month the MRI shows dramatic progression of this tumor. Here's another case where a progression within a month the tumor is much larger. It's outgrown its blood supply so to the center of the tumor actually literally dead cells or necrotic center. This is also characteristic of a glioblastoma. Glioblastomas have often cystic irregular looking appearance on an MRI. Occasionally they can even appear multiple or multicentric and this can cause confusion with the brain metastases until a biopsy is obtained. Again an MRI would show a brain mat would have a different appearance very smooth and rounded. This is a typical brain metastases. These are much easier to treat with surgery or targeted radiation. And again a pathology slide from a brain mat shows how well circumscribed this spot is and again this would be much either easier to cut out or target with radiosurgery. The best advice on treating brain tumors can be found on the website of the nccn.org National Comprehensive Cancer Network. The standard of care for glioblastomas is surgical resection, usually followed by Timodor combined with radiation. Despite this treatment, patients have a poor survival as noted, generally less than a year. Analysis of treatment pattern shows that most patients recur within two centimeters of the original tumor, and the majority occur well within the radiated field. This has prompted radiation oncologists to try to use more intense radiation if possible. The first step is brain surgery. Regardless of tumor type, the best outcome is that the surgeon removes as much tumor as possible, keeps the surgical morbidity or complications as low as possible, and ensures an accurate diagnosis by removing as much of the specimen as possible so the pathologist can study this. There are newer techniques with radiate with surgery. Fluorescence guided resection was used in this diagram to demonstrate there was still some residual cancer shown in the purple on the right in the tumor bed and allowing the surgeon to do a more complete resection. The standard guidelines for a high-grade glioma would start with an MRI and generally a multidisciplinary team, neurosurgeon, radiation, chemotherapy. The next thing would be a maximally safe resection if possible. Some surgeons will put a BCNU wafer into the tumor bed. That's optional. If the tumor cannot be resected completely, at least an open biopsy or stereotactic biopsy would be recommended, at least to confirm the diagnosis. And then the pathologist can tell us whether this is anaplastic, grade 3, or grade 4. The treatment, whether it's an anaplastic oligodendroglioma, or astrocytoma or glioblastoma is about the same. Fractionated radiation with chemotherapy and it's pretty much the same for all different types. If the patient has a very poor performance score, generally described as a KPS or Karnowski score less than 70, then perhaps they would be better treated with palliative or supportive care or hospice care. Karnowski scoring is a way to determine the patient's functional scale a 70% means the patient can care for themselves, though not work. A 60% means they require some help even taking care of themselves. These sort of functional scores are very useful in brain tumor treatment decisions. A glioblastoma, basically the same thing. After surgery, the patient should get fractionated radiation plus Timodor. If the patient is elderly, over 70, perhaps chemotherapy alone or if they have a very low performance score, again, palliative or supportive care or hospice may actually be the best advice. 
The benefits of postoperative radiation were demonstrated back in the 60s and 70s with studies comparing surgery alone with surgery followed by radiation and the survival doubled with radiation. The radiation dose and technique is well spelled out. Generally low-grade gliomas 45 to 54 gray and high-grade gliomas almost always get 60 gray. The standard radiation technique would be to start as soon as possible after surgery and combine the radiation with chemotherapy such as Temidor. Radiation is daily Monday through Friday generally for six weeks. The side effects of brain radiation if it's a large area hair loss, skin irritation, short-term fatigue, mild headaches and occasionally hearing problems if the radiation target is near the eardrums. There can be long-term effects on the brain of radiation such as leukoencephalopathy where the white matter changes occur in the brain. This may affect memory long term. Radio surgery is another technique that may be used to target radiation with a higher dose and a more precise targeting. There was a randomized trial by the RTOG 9305 that was published in 2004 that showed that after surgery if radio surgery was given to the tumor bed and then traditional external radiation along with chemotherapy BCNU in those days there was no benefit. The radio surgery group lived 13.5 months and the group without radio surgery 13.6 months. So basically ever since this RTOG trial the role for radio surgery in upfront or primary treatment uh, has never really been proven. There is however perhaps a role for radiation or radiosurgery for gliomas that recur. The median survival if the patient undergoes a second operation is in the ballpark of three to eight months. Studies with radiosurgery may show a four to six or eight months survival so this may be as effective as surgery. It's worth pointing out though however that radiation induced necrosis called radionecrosis may occur in 24 percent or more of the cases when they're being retreated in this manner. This is a typical radiosurgery case. The original tumor in the panel A can be seen after surgery and B it looks to have gone but in panel C there was a small recurrence. They used targeted radiosurgery, the color lines that surround it and by the time of panel B at 19 months the tumor is gone again. There were studies of stereotactic radio surgery that had survivals in recurrent patients as long as 10 months. There was, however, a study by a statement put out by Astro based on data up to 2004 that basically concluded number one, there's no evidence that radio surgery should be given as the original treatment prior to radiation. Number two, there's not enough evidence to determine the benefit for recurrent cases and not enough evidence to determine whether radiosurgery alone would be a good original treatment. Again this was published in 2005 based on data up to 2004. There have been multiple other studies obviously since then. This study came out in 2005. The median survival in retreating a recurrent glioma was 10 months. Another study doubled the survival from 12 out to 23 months using radiosurgery for a recurrent glioblastoma. Another study had an 8-month survival. A more recent collection of data that goes from 93 to 2011 using stereotactic radiosurgery for recurrent high-grade gliomas has survival as noted here in the 6 to 8 to 11 to 12 month range. And there are studies combining stereotactic radiosurgery with new molecular targeting agents that may have even better results. A recent study using Avastin or Bevacizumab had an 18-month survival for patients with recurrent glioblastomas. Another study that reviewed the gamma knife literature showed a median survival benefit of retreating these patients anywhere from 13 to 26 months. The complications of radiosurgery short term, the symptoms can be worse. Radionecrosis in primary treatment has about a 
5 to 10 percent incident incidents, but in patients who were being retreated, the possibility of radiant necrosis can be 20 to 30 percent, and it may be necessary to be prepared to do more surgery to remove radio surgery or radiant necrosis brain damage. In general, such as this case, radiant necrosis may uh, heal up and get better on its own, as this patient did. But in retreat patients, it may be more serious and more significant, and surgery may be necessary. Chemotherapy has been popularized since the Timador studies were published in the New England Journal in 2005. Temozolomide, or Timador, showed a survival advantage. This is given up front along with the radiation. The survival advantage is not particularly dramatic. This was data out to five years, but there was a 10% five-year survival versus only 2%. And these are the survivor curves. As noted, if the patient has the MGMT hypermethylation, which is a finding the pathologist may point out, the patients may have a better survival with Timador. And if you combine patients who have radiation, MGMT, and Timador, the blue line here, the outlook or survival, may be the best of all. It's still not great, but the patient at least has a fighting chance. As noted previously, there are more studies now showing all the molecular changes found in glioblastomas. All of these chemical or molecular uh, pathways are now targets for new targeted therapy. And they've identified the abnormal cell cycle pathways. And again, all these are targets now for modern targeted therapy. At this time, chemotherapy is still commonly used, and the only targeted therapy is bevacizumab or Vastin, but it seems quite likely over the next few years there'll be multiple, multiple new targeted drugs and hopefully the outlook for glioblastoma will go dramatically up. The factors that affect survival, has, as noted, are related to the type of cancer. Is this an astrocytoma or a glioblastoma? And often the patient's age and performance score. Note a lot of this data that's found on the internet is 10 or 20 years old. The RTOG did an analysis of survival for glioblastoma and malignant glioma patients. They found the most important things were age, type of glioma, and performance score. And they created these groups as noted here. Again, I would point out the data for this is almost 20 years old and the results may be much better today. And similarly, uh, survival with glioblastoma a young patient with a tumor in the frontal lobe, the red group here, group 1, may have a particularly good survival. And it goes down by age or location. And for patients with a recurrent glioma, again, if it's a small tumor, the patient does not require steroids and has a good performance score, he may do quite well. If it's a glioblastoma and the patient is on steroids and elderly, and to survival after recurrence may be quite short. All this needs to be factored into decisions on treatment. Generally, uh, research trials are open for glioblastomas because of the poor outlook. If you go to the website cancer.gov slash clinical trials, you can search the NCI data bank for ongoing active trials. Uh, when I searched this in 2013, as noted, there are over 200 active trials looking at treatment research trials for glioblastoma. All the details and the calculators and the other links can be found on the website about cancer.com.